You're listening to the Bulldog Insider Podcast, brought to you by Essentia Health. It only takes one step, twist, or crunch to know something doesn't feel right. Essentia Health's orthopedic and sports medicine team gets you back to doing what you love with commitment, resilience, intention. We're here to keep you moving forward. Visit EssentiaHealth.org to learn more about orthopedics and sports medicine like nowhere else. Hello and welcome to the Bulldog Insider Podcast, brought to you by Essentia Health. I'm Matt Wellens, the Bulldogs hockey beat writer at the Duluth News Tribune. And I'm Zach Schneider, the television voice of UMD Hockey on My Nine Sports. Welcome to part one of our two-part, two-episode, season six finale of the Bulldog Insider Podcast. Um, sorry to people who love us in person. Uh, we're all on Zoom because it is still snowing outside with no end in sight. But we want to get these episodes recorded and get these out to you because we know you all have lots of questions and there's a lot to talk about after the men's and women's seasons came to a close uh, a little over a week ago now. So joining us for the next two episodes uh, to help us wrap up the 2023-24 men's and women's hockey seasons, as well as look ahead to 2024-2025, it's the voice of the Bulldogs on KDAL, Bruce Siski. Welcome back, Bruce. Uh, thanks for having me, guys. And yeah, I can confirm it's still snowing. Still snowing. Could still be yeah. snowing when you all start listening to this podcast days later after we record it. We'll see. <laughs> Uh, let's start by looking back at the, the women's 2023, 24 season. We're going to get right into things here. A lot to unpack. Um, the women, their season ended with an NCAA regional final loss at the eventual national champion, Ohio state Buckeyes, their second title now in three years, uh, Maura Kroll's team. They made their fourth straight NCAA tournament, finished fourth in the WCHA and posted a 21, 14 and four overall record for their third straight 20 win season. All three of us in the preseason had the finishing fourth in the WCHA. So congrats to all of us on, on getting that right. Um, that might've been the only thing we, we got right uh, from our preseason predictions uh, going back and looking at those. All three of us dodged the question, I believe at the beginning of the year, uh, whether this team would make the NCAA tournament, unless someone has revisionist history and wants to say, Oh yeah, I knew they were going back for a fourth straight tournament. Anyone want to claim that? Oh no, I dodged it completely. It, it did look dicey at times uh, in the second half, but by the time the WCHA final faceoff rolled around, they were uh, a lock. Uh, guys, safe to say that Maura Kroll's team exceeded all of our, maybe not their own expectations, but they exceeded our expectations um, this season. Zach, what do you think? Maybe. I mean, it was great to be in the tournament. Um, you know, certainly we had them pegged as maybe a lower top half team in, in the league when the, the season started, which they were. But, I mean, you look at the numbers, they were 21-14-4 overall, 1-12-1 against Ohio State, Wisconsin, and Minnesota. And nine of those 12 losses were by two or more goals. And the last two losses of their year to Ohio State, they were outscored 14 to nothing. So <clears throat> this was uh, very much a team that was – Good, not great. And, you know, when you look at those kinds of statistics, they weren't even really knocking on the door this year uh, of being great. And and when you look at it that way, I think it's tough to say they exceeded the expectations. But when you phrase it in, were they in the tournament? Did they give themselves a chance? Yes. So if you were if you were setting that as the bar of your expectations, then yes, they narrowly exceeded them. But they were a pretty long ways off from making a frozen four from winning the national championship. And so this is a team that is good, not great, and has some steps to take going forward. Bruce, what did you think of uh, the women? Did they exceed me? How did they, uh, how did their finish uh, compare to your expectations? I would say at the bare minimum, they met expectations and, and maybe slightly exceeded. You look at what they lost and, and, and what they were trying to replace on the fly and what they did was mostly pretty good. Um, I, I get Zach's point. It, those last two losses to Ohio State don't look great. <laughs> no matter how you slice it, it is what it is. Um, you know, they've got now a major hole to fill. However, they're going to fill it in the transfer portal with Haley McLeod transferring. We'll talk more about that coming up. But 
Uh, I, I think you have to, to me, I have to say they at least met them because if, if you're going to be an NCAA tournament team out of the WCHA, you got two options. Number one, you need to beat Ohio State, Wisconsin, or Minnesota more than once or twice. You need to compete in those games and give yourself chances to win at maybe half of those games, or you can't afford to lose to anybody below you in the standings. They lost one game to somebody below them in the standings. That was to St. Cloud State in December. They avenged that in February. They took care of that business. They got themselves into the NCAA tournament by taking care of the business that they needed to take care of. I know it doesn't look great when you break down their record against those top three, but I don't think this team was necessarily at this point ready to beat those top three teams, whether they want to admit it or not. They took a big step forward. They developed some young players. They continued a, a winning culture. I think those are all major steps in the right direction for the program. Yeah, I, I think my answer here is going to flow into our next question of who is your, your MVP of the, the women's hockey team uh, this year. Um, the, the score, they didn't, they lost not just a lot of players, but some, you know, in, in the pro sports, you'd call them franchise players. And um, the women, they, they lost members of the top 25. They lost members who were among the top 25 players uh, to ever play at, at UMD. Emma Soderberg, uh, Gabby Hughes, Ashton Bell, um, and and some fringe ones on there. Maggie Flaherty. They lost some big names. They lost a ton of experience. Um, you know, as I look at that line chart, like this team didn't have the depth that previous teams had. And I think that's where they ran into problems when they ended up against Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Ohio state. I mean, literally it's three teams they, they struggled against. Um, two of those teams were playing for a national championship. Um, I would have liked to see them split the season series against the Gophers. That's because I think UMD and the Gophers were on par this year. Honestly, I don't think the Gophers were, um, you know, four and O better than, than UMD. Um, I, I do think those last two losses to Ohio state maybe taints things a little bit. Maybe if you don't, you know, get blown out nine to nothing in the regional final. Um, if it's a closer, hard fought game, I think maybe people look at it a little differently, but um, I, I I'm saying they exceeded my expectations because I did not expect Av Gascon and Haley McLeod to be as dominant in goal as they did. Like, I don't think anyone could have predicted that. And I'm not trying to knock Emma Soderberg here. I think this is almost like saying how good Evan Haley were like, they didn't miss Emma Soderberg because Evan Haley were so good. And, and I know we had really high expectations for Ev coming in. We tried to tamper him down because she's a freshman, but let's be honest. We, uh, we're all hoping she would be as, as good as she was. And she lived up to her billing. Um, but Haley McLeod, like, I think that's why maybe Ev has the season she has um, having someone to go through that, that year with and not have all the burden placed on, on her. Like you would not want to place the the burden of the entire team on a freshman goaltender, um, you know, coming into her, her first year there. And that's why I'll lead off this next question. Who's your MVP of the Bulldogs women's hockey team. I think it's Haley McLeod. I mean, she was, the season she put together after sitting behind Emma Soderberg uh, was unbelievable. It wasn't anything I, I saw coming. And, and I'll throw that as the question after this will be the biggest surprise, Haley McLeod. Um, I, I didn't think she'd be as good as she was. And and without her, you know, and, and it's probably the same, it's probably a two-way street, right? Like Ev probably doesn't have the season she has without Haley. Haley probably doesn't have the season she has without Ev, so maybe you could make the case that both were, were the MVPs. I don't know. What are your guys' thoughts? Who are the MVPs? Bruce, I'll let you start this one. Uh, your choice is a solid one. It'd be hard to pick, not pick either of these goalies with the season that they had. So I'm going to go off the board and say Reese Hunt because it, it feels like every time this team needed a big goal, and, and it's, I'm thinking about that St. Cloud State series, that Friday game tightened into, into the second period. Not, not a whole lot happening either way. If anything, St. Cloud State had control of that game. Reese Hunt pots the first goal. And that changed that whole game. That changed that whole weekend. And it put UMD in the driver's seat because now St. Cloud State's got the pressure to do something that it hadn't done in a while, and that's score a goal, you know, in, in the flow of play against the UMD goaltender, and they couldn't do it all weekend. So I, I think Reese Hunt is is my choice if I'm not going to pick either of the goaltenders. And trying to pick among those goaltenders is extremely difficult. Haley McLeod 
you know, what she did in helping stabilize things so that Ev, like you said, could kind of get her feet wet, could get used to college life and get adjusted to to playing in this, you know, this country for the first time. English is a second language for her. All these coming together at once. And McLeod being as good as she was allowed Ev to be as good as she was. It was a it was a perfect interplay between those two throughout. Uh, Reese Hunt, by the way, led the team in scoring 34 points um, this year, 16 goal or uh, 16 assists, uh, 18 goals. Those are, those are college highs for, for her after four years at Bemidji state. Um, she has Zach, 20 goals in four years of Bemidji. Yeah. Zach, who is your MVP? Yeah, I think it's one of those three, right? And I think maybe you say it's Reese Hunt because of how little this team scored this year i mean you know to to differentiate between mcleod and gascon is really hard if you're going to narrow, narrow it down to one you could say the goalies are are a 1a pick for this and then reese hunt maybe a 1b um you know and i think that some of what you're talking about with mcleod and gascon and how well they played and how historic this year was is part of why it was so disappointing that this team couldn't put the other pieces of the puzzle together Right. Because it felt like in a lot of games and yes, you're playing some of the most offensively dangerous teams in the country when you talk about Ohio State, Wisconsin and Minnesota. But you've got two goaltenders that over the course of the season delivered a save percentage close to 950. They were allowing about a goal and a half a game in, in, in most games that UMD played. It felt like if you got to two, you were in pretty good shape. And if you got to three, you were going to win the game. I mean, that's we talked about that as comparing it to when Hunter Shepard went on that historic run on the men's side. And that's what McLeod and Gascon delivered. And this team just struggled to score late at, you know, in those games against Ohio State in the playoffs. They struggled to defend. They really didn't give them a, a lot of help. And so I think that was maybe the biggest disappointment. But Reese Hunt, I mean, you know, a lot of things, a lot of things would be different if she wasn't on the team or if Haley McLeod wasn't on the team, Ev Gascon, Matt McMahon, Clara Van Weren, but all other things being equal, take Reese Hunt off this team. Holy man, this team would have struggled mightily. So she was a, a, a great addition uh, to the team as a fifth year transfer and uh, delivered a, a season like we didn't see her um, deliver at Bemidji State. So it was, it was fun to watch. And I think it was fun for Reese to kind of be unleashed uh, in the offensive zone after four years at Bemidji where Maybe that part of her game struggled. So, um, yeah, I mean, you can't go wrong with any of those three. Who was your guy's biggest uh, surprise? You know, mine mine was, you know, my most Haley. The, my MVP was my biggest surprise. I, I think for all the reasons I just talked about, you know, Reese Hunt was a, a big surprise just because of the offensive output that she had. But to go a, a little bit further into this, I think either Hannah Baskin or Mary Kate O'Brien were, were really good took really good steps forward. Um, and if I had to pick one, I'd say Hannah Baskin, uh, just because she played more meaningful minutes on the line. She gave them a solidified second pair uh, behind Joe Smith and and what ended up being Toba Henderson um, after uh, Ashton Bell uh, graduated. So I'll, I'll go with Hannah Baskin um, as the biggest surprise. And hopefully it's something that can continue because they're going to need it, um, you know, as they go forward against some of those top teams. Bruce, who was your biggest surprise? Yeah, oddly enough, I was thinking Mary Kate O'Brien as well, but the, the other choice I had in my mind was Gita Carlson on the back end. I thought she really developed well as the first as, as the season went on, especially that the middle part of the of the year, you could see her gain confidence almost shift to shift. But I'll I'll, I'll say MK because I, I think she gave them a, a, a you know, yeah, she's not the biggest player, but she gave them a dimension of physicality up front that I think was really important for them. And I think it's going to be really important going forward, which is almost as important as what she gave them this year, but what she showed that she could do going forward, because obviously, again, you're losing some players up front and you know she's going to take on, I think, a bigger role, even even more so in 2024-25. So a major step and, and a nice one to see from Mary Kate O'Brien. Uh, who is the most important player returning to the UMD women in 2024-25? And I feel like because, and we're going to get into who's going, who's coming and going, um, Haley McLeod going into the transfer portal. Are, are we all in agreement? Ev Gascode is the most important player coming back now. It's her net and she's got to own it from start to finish. Bruce? I, I would think so. I, 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 I would struggle to think of anybody that's more important than Ev because of what you just said, Haley McLeod is leaving. And that means this is Ev Gascone's net and, and that, that's, 
we I, we all can think back to you know when Maddie got to Maddie Rooney got to UMD and and, and Moore I thought handled that perfectly. She wasn't ready to give Maddie the net as a freshman. Kayla Black took a bunch of starts Maddie's freshman year that allowed Maddie to get acclimated. But that September before her sophomore season, this is Maddie's net. It was made very clear and she ran with it. It was out it, outstanding and that's what got her, of course on the Olympic team was her play in her sophomore season at UMD. I, I think Ev Gascone is the most important player coming back, and it's not close. Zach, who's your most important player? Yeah, it may not be close, but Clara Van Weeren, uh, you know, if anybody is close, uh, is is a very important returning player for UMD as well. Uh, you lose Reese Hunt and Manny McMahon uh, to the top two goal scorers uh, on this year's team, and Clara – is going to come in and, and I think very likely be the captain. She's going to be somebody that is looked to to not only score a lot of goals, but to lead a, a fairly, uh, you know, young and inexperienced in big moments uh, type of roster. Uh, maybe big moments when it comes to NCAA hockey. We'll talk about some of the freshmen that they have coming in that have certainly played in, in other big games uh, before UMD. But uh, I want to share something. Um, I can't remember. It was about a month left in the season, and I was we were t- talking about the younger players and the secondary scoring uh, for UMD during the media availability. And I asked Clara, uh, what was it like? Does she remember when she was a younger player? you know, up and down, second, third line, that type of thing. And when she started to score, how much confidence that brought her. And she kind of cut me off and said, I've never been a third line player. I've always been on the first or second line when I've been here. And I've always been looked at to score goals. And she didn't do it disrespectfully. She just, you know, very, you know, politely cut me off and said, I'm not that type of player. I've always been looked to, to be a leader offensively for this team. And I, I mentioned that story because that is the Clara Van Weeren that needs to show up next year. They need her, in essence, in, especially in the first month to two months of the season, to really kind of put this team on her back and say, follow me. We're going to go do all the things that we talked about. We're going to compete with Ohio State, Wisconsin, and Minnesota. We're going to take care of business against the lower half of the league. This is how we do it. You guys just have to follow my lead, and we're going to get to where we want to be. If, if that kind of Clara Van Weeren shows up, I, I think she could set some career highs next year uh, in her fifth year of eligibility. And then if they get the goaltending like they did this year from Ev Gascon, you know, maybe this is a team with some of the in, incoming offense that they have uh, next year that could do a little bit better, uh, you know, against some of those top three teams in the WCHA and across the country. All right, let's talk about who the Bulldogs uh, are, are losing this offseason. We mentioned Haley McLeod is in the transfer portal, along with fourth-line sophomore winger Danny Burnett. Uh, Katie Davis, senior wing, uh, who missed time to, because of injury this year. She's also in the transfer portal. She's fifth-year eligible. She wasn't expected to come back uh, after graduating from UMD for a fifth year, so she's looking to play that fifth year somewhere else. Uh, and then they're graduating Reese Hunt and Man and McMahon, uh, Paula Bergstrom, also eligible for a fifth year, but but she's, uh, it sounds like heading back to Sweden as well. She hasn't put her name in the transfer portal or anything. So who's going to be the biggest loss, you guys think? And and my answer here is going to go against everything I've just said uh, prior to this. My biggest loss is going to be Man and McMahon, because where do you find a player that is as consistent as as she is? 173 consecutive games to have that person in your lineup. And those are 173 games she played at an extremely high level as well. So that's my biggest loss. I think they're really going to miss man and McMahon. Um, She probably, she had a great career at UMD. Um, Didn't score the goals like Reese Hunt did, but um just you know the the cliche the the straw that stirs the drink I I think that was that was Bannon uh, for this program in the last five years Zach who's your biggest loss Yeah I mean Claire Van Weeren is, is going to have to fill those shoes of Man and McMahon right and it's not an easy uh, it's not an easy gig uh, for Clara so look you know we'll be talking about that and looking for that early in the year and throughout the year next year but I mean Haley McLeod I think is you know, all things considered, probably the biggest loss, you know, but saying that, knowing that you have Ev going in the, in the background, who's ready to hopefully take the net every night and not have to be looking over her shoulder. The biggest thing with that is that 
the competition between those two, Mark Kroll made it clear throughout the year that it wasn't just game performance. It wasn't automatic that they were going to go Friday, Saturday. She valued a lot what they did in practice through the week. And I think both those goaltenders learned really quickly that if they weren't on their game, that the other was was right there and was ready to to take a string of starts uh, away from the other. And, and they admitted that to us on the podcast. They said, I'm really happy for the other one's success, but I'd prefer it if she didn't play another game all year. Um, now Ev Gascon is probably going to start, if not every game, close to every game. Uh, but she needs to find that, uh, that inner fire, um, that Haley McLeod type shadow to follow her through practice. So um, e- even if it's just for that, Haley McLeod, I think will be the biggest loss. Bruce, how about you? I think it's man, and uh, and with all due respect to Haley McLeod, because I, that's what I think of Ev Gascon. Uh, but man, and it's not just the leadership piece. It's not just you know what she's meant to the culture. It's not just the consistency of not just her game, but the, her consistency of being able to play, which we talk so much about as she broke that consecutive games record. It's also what she does. It's that speed, that physicality in the middle of the rink, and Maura Kroll is so high on the the importance of center play and how she wants her teams to play. And I don't know that there's anybody on this roster that can duplicate the speed and the physicality of man and McMahon's game in the middle of the rink. That's to me, that's a concern going forward. And and it's a challenge, I think, for this coaching staff to try to find the the players that a player or players that can do that. Because all due respect to Clara Van Weeren, her game is physicality but her game isn't necessarily that speed element that Manon brings. Uh, last one we're kind of getting into here before we take a break and switch over to the men. Uh, recruiting. Everyone loves talking about recruiting. It's what you all wait for on this podcast. That's why I <laughs> save it to the very end. Keep you listening. Which recruit are you most excited to see in a Bulldog jersey in 2024-25? And uh, why is it Canada's all-time leading goal scorer at the Under-18 World Championships in, in Caitlin Kramer? Uh, she's one of three forwards signed for next season, along with Canadian Reese Logan, uh, Zoe Croc of Pittsburgh. That's Kenny Ryder's uh, favorite uh, Bulldog recruit coming in next year. Uh, and then uh, defenseman uh, Camden Davis from Chicago is also coming in. Um, and as we said, uh, Maura Kroll is going to be going uh, shopping in the transfer portal uh, as well for some scoring, I'm assuming, and uh, a backup for, for Ev Gascon. But um, Caitlin Kramer. I don't think we can rely on her to score to solve all of UMD scoring issues next year, but uh, I, I think that's the goal score that, that this team could have used this year. Um, if you look at just her history, um, you know, growing up playing hockey and what she's done at the at the U18 Worlds. Guys, am I wrong? Caitlin Kramer, am I hyping this kid up too much? Not from what I've seen, that's for sure. Um, is she from everything I've read and everything I've seen, she's incredibly talented. And, and she's a great fit for, like you said, what they're looking to, to what they're going to be looking to add in, in for 24, 25. I'm excited to see her in our colors and, and what she can do. Obviously you don't want to be in a position to be heaping too much pressure on a freshman walking in the door, which was why it was great to have Haley play as well as she did. So Ev wouldn't have to deal with all that. Um, but I, I think in terms of, of, of complementary scoring, you know, Clara Van Weeren plays a role there and, and, and Jenna Lowry in the middle plays a role there and Mary Kate O'Brien. But, but I, I think one of the other key answers is going to come, like you said, Matt, in the transfer portal. So we don't really know who that's going to be yet. Zach, your thoughts on what Kroll has coming, coming in? It, well, it'll be interesting to to see what they're able to to get out of the transfer portal as, as the offseason goes on. Can they find another Reese Hunt? you know, um, 20 goal scorers are, are usually not all that available, uh, in the transfer portal. Uh, Reese didn't quite get to 20, but she got to 18 and Elizabeth Shiger, uh, we remember her came back uh, or came to UMD a couple years back, uh, for the one year and, and scored 22. So UMD has had good luck finding offensive, uh, output in the transfer portal. They might need to do it again. Um, Caitlin Kramer, you know, sometimes on the women's side, you know, you you hear about these recruits and, and it takes maybe a little bit of digging to find out 
where they were if they're not Minnesota kids, you know, kids we've heard about in the state tournament or anything like that. Um, but Caitlin Kramer's not one of those. Uh, you know, you say her name if you follow the women's game at all. Uh, you've heard that name said and said a lot. Um, I don't think it's fair to expect her to come in and score 20 goals uh, in the first uh, season as a freshman, but she probably has that type of ability. I, it wouldn't shock me if she did it. Um, and the top end scoring is, is what UMD has been missing. I mean, we talk about the goaltenders, you've got the goaltenders to compete at the highest level. Do you have the goal scoring three times in more Kroll's career or coaching career at UMD has UMD had a 20 goal scorer. In 16-17, it was Lara Stalder. They lost to Minnesota at Amsoil in the NCAA quarterfinals. It was a super close game. They were a bounce of a puck away from going to a Frozen Four that year. In 1920, uh, Gabby Hughes scored 20. They missed the NCAA tournament that year. It's a bit of an outlier. And then in 21-22, they had three 20-goal scorers, and Anna Klein had 19. Uh, they had Jaguar Hughes and Naomi Rogi that year all get to 20. When you look at national champions on the women's side, the best scoring teams typically are in play at the end of the year. And those best scoring teams typically have one to three players who get close to or around that 20 goal mark. It seems to be kind of the Mendoza line for women's hockey. And so Caitlin Kramer is somebody who could come in and provide that. I think she's going to be really exciting. And I don't mind saying that there there is a, a ton of expectations on her. She might be one of the most talked about recruits on the women's side coming into college you know maddie rooney was may maybe another just because of what she did in minnesota but like gabby hughes ashton bell these players developed their really big acclaim while they were at umd not necessarily beforehand and and so caitlin kramer is one that comes in and i think has already kind of dealt with that and i think it's going to be exciting to see what she can do at the ncaa level all right, we're going to take a short break. When we come back, we'll shift to the men's 2023-24 season. You're listening to the Bulldog Insider Podcast, brought to you by Essential Health. Greetings from Northlandia, a place to bring your curiosity, because here you will find curiosities. Whether it's a look inside the Northern Rail Train Car Inn or an introduction to Duluth's musical roboticist, Robot Rickshaw, we celebrate the region's distinctive people, places, and history. Each week, I'm joined by my fellow reporters who share the unique and fascinating stories that they discover while exploring the Northland. You can find new episodes of the Northlandia podcast on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Join us along this journey and discover the extraordinary stories that you just might miss if you're not in the right place at the right time, ready to step off the beaten path with no rush to return here in Northlandia. Hi, I'm Maria Lockwood, a reporter with the Superior Telegram. Explore Superior and Douglas County history with me on Archive Dive, a monthly podcast available at superiortelegram.com or wherever you listen to podcasts. Welcome back to the Bulldog Insider Podcast, brought to you by Essentia Health Orthopedics and Sports Medicine. They're proud to be the team physicians for the UMD Bulldogs and provide sports medicine care to more than 25,000 student athletes in the community to ensure they can compete at the highest level while protecting their long-term health and athletic futures. Thanks to Essentia Health for their support of the Bulldog Insider Podcast. I'm Matt Wellens, along with Zach Schneider and Bruce Siski. All right, guys, let's talk about a, a disappointing season uh, for the men's hockey program in 2023-24. Um, they, they finished below all our expectations, taking seventh in the NCHC this year. They were nine points back of sixth place uh, Western Michigan at, at the end of the, the season. None of us had UMD as an NCAA tournament team, I believe, at the start of the year. Uh, maybe Bruce did. Bruce was the, the most optimistic of all of us. He had them finishing third in the NCHC. Um, I had UMD fifth and Zach had them sixth. Uh, none of us got it. Um, also, none of us correctly picked who would win the regular season. Maybe I didn't specify the question enough. Uh, we all picked Denver to win the NCHC title. They won the postseason title. Uh, North Dakota won the uh, the regular season title. Bruce, where did you have North Dakota? Fifth. Fifth, yeah. Fifth. Bruce, Bruce really bombed. Uh, I, that's not this, a good this, year for me. This year. Not a good year for you. Not a good year for the nope. UMD men's hockey team. Um, guys, what what went wrong? Bruce, I'll, I'll start with you. And let's oh. try and 
keep the the comments to you know how long do we have here yeah we um, don't have a we don't have forever Wyatt can't uh, edit a two-hour podcast <laughs> Well, let's see. Uh, in the fifth period of the season, the team's best player suffered a season-ending injury. Uh, that seemed to just kind of be the start, didn't it? it, it if we only had known that, that that was a precursor to what we were about to see, this was not just one thing. This was a combination of, I think, some older guys didn't produce at the level that the, that, that was hoped of them. Um I think you have obviously losing Dominic James that threw a monkey wrench and just about everything you're talking about, your best face off guy, you're talking about a power play guy, a penalty kill guy, everything is in arrears at that point. Cause now the guy you're planning to build the entire team around isn't going to play again all year. So that played a role, you know, Will Francis not being able to play that played a role. Cause there's a dimension to his game that nobody else in that blue line can bring. It was a perfect storm of everything that could go wrong pretty much did and we saw what happened i in my defense when i wrote my nchc predictions i said i had a ceiling and a floor for each team and the floor i had for umb was seventh well everything went wrong and they finished seventh so there you go bruce mentioning the injuries there uh i estimated and we don't this is like an i call it an estimate because Sometimes we're not always told about someone maybe missing a game due to injury. I'm calling it injury, illness, or ineligibility. Th that right there tells you like the season, right? That I have a, the <laughs> yeah. three eyes of, of UMD hockey in 2023-24, in the men's team. Uh, 116 games uh, missed due to uh, injury, illness, and ineligibility. Uh, Zach, briefly, in, in under two hours, what, what went wrong? Yeah, you know, there, the margin for error going into the year was was always going to be pretty thin. You know, even if everybody stayed healthy, even if guys produced to, you know, their career highs, this wasn't a UMD team that we went into the year and they jumped off the page and said, this is going to be a national title contender. And then, uh, you know, those things start going to ro going wrong and, and the snowball effect, uh, you know, happens pretty quickly. Um, you know, I think the three of us are in a unique position because we get to know the, the guys on the team and the staff uh, pretty well by the time uh, the players when their careers are done here. Um, and so I, I think knowing them, you know, some of them behind closed doors, it, it's easy to want to pile on and to say that this team just kind of quit on the year, you know, and, and the, the on ice uh, results, you know, maybe speak to that and i get that and we, we the three of us have seen a lot of that out in the community you know knowing these guys and knowing the the coaching staff that's i think absolutely an unfair accusation um but there were a lot of uh players i think that maybe didn't buy into their role as much as we've seen on some of those national championship teams um you know guys that uh you know were you know counted on to to jump in and, and jump up from the third line to the first line or jump down from the second line to the third line, kill a penalty here or there. Um, we've seen all those things really kind of manifest themselves and go right, and it ends in a national championship. Uh, sp speaking specifically about the 17-18 uh, season, when things just kind of came together in the right way, this year things just kind of came apart in the wrong way. Um, and I don't know if there's any one thing that you can, can pin it on, but, uh, it just slowly unraveled, uh, and then ended obviously in that, uh, that series in the playoffs to Denver. Just to build on what Matt was saying with, with injury time missed. And, and this is just three guys, Dominic James, Will Francis, who, you know, as of the point that the roster was constructed, was expected to play a big role on this team. And all of a sudden was lost for half the year and then the whole year and then throw Cole Spicer's ineligibility in there. Those three, just those three combined to miss 90 games. That doesn't count anybody else that was injured at any point in the season. Yeah. And, and, you know, you look at Spicer and James, those are two, those are your top two centers right there. And then the, the that position just got, and, and Scott, I don't know if he joked or if he was serious, blame this on me. Cause I wrote early in the year about the center depth that he had going into the year. Um, 64 games lost this year by centermen. Um, and a majority of those are, are Dominic James and, and, and Cole Spicer. So guys weren't even, you know, Carter Loney started the year banged up and, and missed time. Um, Jack Smith, uh, at the end of the year, Matthew Perkins, who was supposed to be a wing 
He moves to center. He misses time. Like it was just, this was an odd season. Um, we're going to talk to Scott here uh, next week. Um, and I'm curious to see what, what toll this took on him. Cause there was at one point uh, when I went and asked him about uh, Gus Hendrickson, um, former Bulldogs coach had passed away. And I, I gave him a heads up that we we're going to start a post-game press conference. And I was going to ask about that because we had all just learned it kind of that night or, or the, the day before. And um, he mentioned, we've done a lot of these this year where he's had to give a statement about something happening, whether it's uh, the death of Adam Johnson uh, rocking the team at the start of that first eight game losing streak. Um, Dominic James being lost for the year, Will Francis, um, you know, his cancer coming back. Um, then it looks like he's gonna make a comeback and he decides to, to redshirt the, the second year to, to get back to full strength. Cole Spicer, academic ineligibility. It just went on and on this year. Um, I do wonder the mental toll all of that took on, on this team, um, this year. And if it wore on guys at, at the end, especially when they went on another, um, eight game winless streaks. Sorry, they're all winless streaks that they went on. Uh, oh, but oh seven and one there. Um, it it was tough. Uh, who was who was the MVP? Are, are we all in agreement on this? Uh, is this another who is the MVP and why was it Ben Steves? Um, who by the way is is now uh, a member of the Florida Panthers organization after scoring uh twenty four goals this year. Zach, is that your MVP? Steves, that's who I have. Yeah, it has to be. I, I mean, you know, anytime a team struggles like this and a, a guy scores at, at that level, and then we've talked earlier in the year, he's the first Bulldog with back-to-back 20-goal years since Justin Fontaine. Uh, he's just the third to do it under Scott Sadlin, Junior Lassard being the other one. Um, he slowed down uh, considerably uh, in the second half of the season. His first half, he was on pace at one point for like something stupid, like 45 goals or something like that, you know, midway through November. Um, so, you know, he came back to earth and regressed a little bit in the second half, but that's when the team was starting to, you know, play considerably worse as well. And, and guys figured out that, you know, Hey, if you can shut down Ben Steves, you can shut down UMD. So um, yeah, I mean, he was really good. The only other person I think that, you know, maybe came to my head um, is Matthew Thiessen because I think he played really, really well. Uh, didn't have the wins to go along with it, but wins are not a goaltender stat in this case. Um, you know, he was, he was, he played above the level that I expected, which is what you need on hockey teams that are going to get to the level that UMD wants to be back at. Tyson did his part this year um, and maybe was only overshadowed by the offensive Ben Steves. Yeah. Those 116 games that I, I cite, like they really needed T Te Tyson was probably my runner up. I thought about that as well, Zach. Um, they needed him at the end of the year. Cause um, Zach Stasekel was, was banged up um, legitimately banged up at, at the end of the year. There were a few games that he was on the bench, um, either listed as the second or third goaltender, and uh, I, I, they were only going to put him in there if Matt Teason was was unable to, to stand. If Teason could have like lied on the ice, I think they might have let him just just stay there. Um, so yeah, Teason at, at the end there, I, I, I think um, definitely you could put in that category. Um, a stat for Ben Steves: UMD was ten four and three when Steves scored a goal. 2 16 and 2 when he didn't score. The two wins were October 20th versus Bemidji State and March 9th versus St. Cloud State. Bruce, your thoughts on who the MVP was this year? Anything to add? Uh yeah, it's Ben Steves. And by the way, uh Ben Steves had the primary assist on the game winning goal in that St. Cloud State game that you referenced. So he didn't score, but he still played a starring role in them winning the game to begin with. So uh it just that just underscores, you know, how important he was to this team. And if it's not Ben Steves, it's probably Matthew Tees, and I would agree. He gave them a chance to win a lot of games. The Bulldogs pl played three times shorthanded this year in, in terms of not having enough skaters to field the full lineup. The first of those was the Saturday game at St. Cloud. Luke Johnson got hurt in the Friday game. Luke Lohheit was suspended uh, for the Saturday game, so that neither could play. Tyson started that game. And he allowed six goals, and he still gave him a chance to win. They they lost the game six to five, and it was just one of those nights. The game was weird both ways, and he gave him a shot. But they in every game that he played, they had an opportunity, and he just he didn't get the benefits of of the the so called run support. So yeah, I would, I would say it's either Steve's or Tyson, but definitely Steve's is the first choice. It, you know, being able to score at the the volume he scored when everybody knows that you're the guy. 
that's pretty impressive stuff. And and he did that for most of the year. He was on a 30 goal pace into February. Guys, who's your biggest surprise of the Bulldogs this year? Bruce, I'll let you start this one off. Uh, I would say Matthew Perkins. Uh, you know, guy walks in here as a winger. He's never really played center. And I'd have to go back and look at all the line charts to confirm this. But uh, he played probably 85, 90% of his shifts were played as a center this season. And, you know, it was one of those things. I remember talking to Scott down in Milwaukee uh, right before the, the tournament, the first game against Northeastern. And they put Perkins on wing for that game. And, and he said, you know, we want to get him some offensive confidence. We think we can get him away from the middle and, and just, you know, maybe let him play a little more free and that might help him. That lasted one game. And I think he played center pretty much the rest of the year after that. So, you know, the fact that he continued to get better defensively down low on faceoffs and, and still was able to chip in offensively down the stretch. And, and we saw that too. It's a pretty impressive year for a young guy, 160 pounds soaking wet, the youngest guy on the team, 19 years old. And, and for him to do that was really impressive. Zach, who was your biggest surprise? I want to throw somebody a little bit different at you and say Joey Pierce. Um, you know, he came, uh, Matt's uh, upset that I took his pick. Uh, Can I no, play he... poker with you, Matt? Because that was a, <laughs> you, you reacted immediately. I thought I had a really good pick right here. I'm like, I'm going <laughs> off the board. Joey Pierce, no one's going to. Go with it, but um, go ahead. You shouldn't my let guys us go out. first all the time. Wow, but, I'm trying uh, to be a gracious host. Go ahead, Zach. Yeah. No, he was, I mean, he was really good. Not only did he solidify himself on the back end and, and play some really important minutes on the penalty kill, but he was a guy that with some of those injuries and suspensions and mid-game changes that played forward, I, I counted three or four times minimum. Um you know, sometimes he didn't know because even when he was playing defense, he was still uh, involved offensively. Uh, but at, at least a, a couple times, if not a handful of times, he was uh, asked to play on the wing. And, um, you know, one thing that Scott Sandlin told us about Joey is that he's a guy doesn't talk a lot, uh, you know, doesn't uh, necessarily jump off the stat sheet, but you ask him to go do something on the ice and he goes and does it. Um, and he, so he, he's not ever going to be the MVP of UMD season, but he, he might be one of the most important pieces as they go forward because you know what you're going to get out of him. He's consistent. You can send him out there for meaningful minutes. And quite honestly, Joey's one of those guys where if you're not talking about him, you know he played a good game. Um, and uh, so I, I like the steps he took forward, and I'm excited to see uh, hopefully he can play the entire season on the blue line next year. Yeah, Joey Pierce started the year as that that 19th skater, that that seventh defenseman, uh, a, a guy that, you know, you thought maybe he was going to be in and out of the lineup all year. And by the, it took maybe, I, I don't know, uh, with all the injuries and illnesses and ineligibilities, uh, they had no choice. They needed that guy in the lineup every night because you didn't know what, what you'd need him to do. And um, that's the one guy, it didn't matter what happened. I, I could ask Scott, what'd you think of Joey Pierce tonight? And Joey's Joey. That, that, that was Scott's quote. Like, he never had anything bad to say about Joey this year. Um, and the guys, I think they were calling him the Swiss Army Knife or something like that because he'd just go out there and, and do whatever they needed him to do. And and that's – UMD needed more guys like that this year uh, to succeed. They needed more guys to just, you know, do whatever they were told to do and and just do it well. Um, yeah, Joey Pierce, uh, big, big step for him th this season. Um, and I'm curious to see what we'll see him do next year. Uh, hopefully he doesn't have to play goaltender, but like Zach said, hopefully Joey stays on the blue line for an, an entire year. Uh, and, and there we'll get into recruiting, uh, in this two-parter uh, at, at one point, but, uh, they'll hopefully have reinforcements, uh, there. So, uh, let's see, uh, most important player returning for the UMD men next year. And I think this is a good time to run through who's everyone losing and who's coming back. Well, that's not entirely known on who's all coming back yet. Um, as we record this on March 26th, the underclassmen transfer portal does not open until March 31st. So there's going to be some movement uh, between when we record this and maybe even when you listen to this. Um, ben Steves, he's not coming back next year, signed with the Florida Panthers. Uh, fifth years, Quinn Olson, Luke Lohite, Connor McMenamin, and Matthew Teason. They are all moving on. Um, I said this on Twitter one night. I really hope some pro team 
signs Tease and just because man, he's fun to watch. He'll entertain some crowds out out there. Uh, Scott Sandlin confirmed to me this week they're not bringing back any of the fifth year seniors. Um, I think that's something all of us kind of figured out based on the recruiting and such. Uh, true seniors, uh, you know, Blake Biondi, Zach Stasekel, and Darian Goats not going to be back. Goats and State School, it sounds like, are exploring pro options. And uh, Blake Biondi will be transferring to Notre Dame for his fifth and final season. So, guys, uh, considering that, um, who who do you think is the uh, the most important player coming back next season? Zach, I'll start with you, even though you just stole the answer to the last question from me. Well, I'm not going to steal Bruce's answer because the answer here is Dominic James. Um, you know, he's the heart and soul of this team. And and when you have uh, a, a team that loses its heart and soul in, in the third game of the year, it makes it really tough. Um, but I'll let Bruce talk more about Dom. I, I wanted to say Aaron Pionk and Aiden Dubinsky because they really started to gel in the second half of the year as much as the team was around them was struggling. They're both still really young uh, Aaron still really new to that position as a whole. Um, and they've got a solidified top pair defense, uh, defensive pairing going into the next year. And I think it's going to be so important with, uh, you know, most likely a new goaltender, uh, and most likely, uh, at least a couple freshman defensemen, uh, in, in and out of the lineup throughout the year that that top pair is solidified. They can go out, they can play a lot of minutes together. And so, uh, in lieu of saying Dominic James, uh, I'm going to say Aaron Pionk and Aiden Dubinsky. Bruce, go ahead. Well, I mean, it's, it's Dominic James, right? But, uh, and, and it's a quick story on that. And, and Matt can attest to this. We were over at the morning skate in Colorado Springs and Dom got to go on that trip when, when Blake Biondi could not. And you, you, if you watch this team practice with Dominic James at maybe what, 75% at that point, that still raises the level of even a morning skate. That's, that's Dominic James at, at his essence. And, you know, him back healthy raises everything. It raises the level of the team's play on the ice, but more importantly, it raises the level of practice Monday through Thursday. And I'm not, this ain't a rip on anybody, but nobody else had that ability the way Dominic James has that ability. The other guy I want to mention is Will Francis, because there, again, as I said, going into this, there was nobody on that blue line that plays the game the way Will does, that edge, that physicality, and that shot that he has. Those are all factors that were very hard to duplicate with anybody else on this team that they lost when Will couldn't play. Getting him back, if he's back healthy, oh my goodness, does that make a difference, along with the guys they've got coming in. Yeah, we were watching James practice in the morning skate, and, and Bruce can attest to this. I thought he looked so good out there. I was hoping he was coming back and making a surprise I thought we were going to get it. Is that Dom James music uh, at, the, at that Friday game against uh, CC? Um, I love a good story. And that would have been a great story at that point in the year for Dom James to make a surprise appearance um, back with the Bulldogs. I know what all of you are yelling at me right now, Matt, that would cost me your eligibility. If Dom James was healthy this year, he also would have signed. We would have had a second pro signing. He would have signed before Ben, ben Steve signed. Um, there'd be two Bulldogs uh, heading to the NHL right now in, instead of just Steve. So, all right, uh, we're going to wrap it up right there for part one of the Bulldog Insider Podcast season finale. We're going to save recruiting and roster building and all that for part two. Um, we'll be answering all the questions you submitted in that episode, or at least try to. Uh, some of you submitted like five questions. I wasn't going to give you five questions, um, but I, I got to do for, for some of you, maybe more. Um, we got a number of those questions are about roster building for both the men and the women. So um, we're going to cover that in part two of this season finale. Watch for that in your podcast feed. You can find the Bulldog Insider podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Subscribe and rate us. For more Bulldogs hockey coverage, visit therinklive.com and dilutenewstribune.com. Thanks to our sponsor, Essential Health, for their continued support of the Bulldog Insider podcast all six seasons of this show and thanks to all of you for listening thanks to all of you who submitted your questions we're going to get to those next in part two thanks for listening <laughs>